Hi, I'm Justin Salomon, and this video presentation dives into optimal vector establishment and portal development techniques for arthroscopic knee meniscus surgery. In disclosure, I'm the founder and chief medical officer of Soterix Orthopedics and a consultant for MoxiMed. So meniscus surgery includes partial meniscectomy, meniscus repair, and meniscus transplant. And repair can be broken down into inside-out, outside-in, or all-inside techniques. And with all of these procedures, it's really important to have good portal vectors. It's important because this lets you access compartment regions in a way that enables an optimal surgical result. It decreases risk to surrounding chondral surfaces, and it decreases the amount of trauma that occurs in the fat pad. The most important things that I'll be discussing today are how to establish an optimal vector for the working portal. Some, I'll give some techniques for developing and maintaining one clean portal and then also talk about the various regions of the meniscus and how best to approach them. Okay, so let's start with a little bit of room setup. And the most important thing here is to give yourself the best ability to generate varus and valgus stress across the knee. A soft lift is placed underneath the contralateral knee to prevent traction injury to the femoral nerve. And then these lateral posts are nice because they can flop up to allow counterforce during valgus stress and because they can flop down to give freedom of the leg so that you can place the knee in figure of four for varus stress. The problem with this technique is that sometimes you do need an assistant to hold down on the femur so that it doesn't pop up during valgus stress. And so for valgus stress to open up the medial compartment, I prefer the clamshell because it goes all the way around the knee and it prevents it from migrating superiorly and really gives you the best control of the femur during the procedure. But I will often use the lateral post if I know I have a lateral meniscus tear because I like the figure of four just for the ease of comfort on my own body when holding varus stress. Okay, so now let's move on to establishing the vector of the working portal, which is so important. So if this is the patella and this is the patellar tendon, the medial meniscus is depicted here and this is the posterior horn away from us and the anterior horn closest to us. And there's the meniscus body off to the left. We're going to make our anterolateral portal based on the landmarks of the inferior pole of the patella and the lateral margin of the patellar tendon as typical. And the medial portal will usually be a little bit higher than the lateral portal. But it's really important that prior to making this incision, you look in the compartment that has the meniscus tear and use a spinal needle to establish where to incise. And what's important is that a spinal needle be used to help determine which potential incision location will allow parallel access to the region under the meniscus. Too high and the portal will force instruments into the tibial plateau posteriorly and into the femur proximally and too low and the portal will force instruments into a superior vector that can only partially be compensated for by levering up on the skin and down on the anterior tibial plateau and anterior horn of the meniscus. And so different patients will have different best incision spots based on the unique geometric bony attributes of their particular knees. And this is important no matter what type of procedure you're doing on a meniscus. If it's partial meniscectomy, Using the best incision location and thus the best portal vector will allow you to easily debride the femoral and tibial sides of the tear. If you're coming in too high, you can really only debride the tibial side of the tear without the femur blocking you. And if you're too low, the skin and the anterior horn of the meniscus and anterior tibia block you from debriding the inferior tissue. Now some biters do have an up curve in the shaft which can compensate to some degree for a high portal, particularly in the medial compartment but finding the best portal will still give you the most freedom. It becomes even more important when we start using repair devices such as the FastFix 360. Even with the curved tip, if you have a low portal, you can only access the top, and if you have a high portal, you can only access the bottom. A best portal will allow you to get to the full region of the meniscus, and the combination of a best portal with a curved tip gives you the most options in terms of access. This portal vector is also important for devices such as the Soterix Novostitch, in which the upper jaw relaxes behind the femur as the lower jaw is protracted forward in line with the shaft of the device. This device passes a circumferential compression stitch, which reduces the tibial and femoral sides of the tear at the same time. So no matter what meniscus procedure you're doing, it's optimal to establish the skin incision spot and vector before incising, and of course be certain to incise where your best needle was located. You can confirm your portal after incision by bringing a trocar in, and if you're too low, you will see divergence of the trocar and tibial plateau in the space underneath the meniscus, and the trocar will crash into the meniscus. 
Whereas if you're too high, you'll crash into the posterior aspect of the tibial plateau, and the vector formed by the tibial plateau and the trochar in the region under the meniscus will be convergent. This again is in contrast to a best incision spot and best vector, which will allow you full access to the meniscus and a straight trochar shot all the way back to the capsule. The vector formed between the peripheral aspect of the tibial plateau and the trochar in this case will be parallel. And you'll have optimal access to the top and bottom of the meniscus. A couple other pearls in terms of where to make your incision. The sloping of the plateau as it approaches the tibial spine can restrict access. So if you're working on the root region, you might want an incision spot located further from the patellar tendon, whereas if you're working on the body region, it's better to be closer to the patellar tendon so that you remain square to the meniscus in terms of your approach. So here's just a quick clinical example of making the portals. Marked is the inferior pole of the patella, palpated is the lateral margin of the patellar tendon, and the lateral incision line will then be marked here. And the medial portal usually ends up being a little bit higher than the lateral portal. But again, the camera will be inserted and then that medial portal incision spot will be determined. And here's a right knee cadaver and the lateral portal will go there and the medial will go somewhere a little bit higher than that. And knife is used to incise the skin for the camera portal and the camera is inserted with the knee in extension. So first I'll pop it through the skin a little bit, then I'll extend the knee and slide into the patellofemoral compartment. And this is important because this allows you to swing the fat down underneath the camera and it aids in visibility of the entire operation. If you do need an outflow, some people will make another accessory portal. But if it's a little cloudy at first, I'll just put the suction on the other camera flow port and oscillate between inflow and suction until I can see. And then I'm going to use a spinal needle to establish my incision spot. So first I'm going to go where I marked. This will be my, uh, I'll mark it one here. And you'll be able to see that this incision spot and approach vector ends up being a little low. The anterior aspect of the tibial plateau and the anterior horn of the meniscus are forcing the spinal needle up toward the femur. And I can bend it a little and try to get it down there. But in the end, the vector that is formed between the spinal needle and the tibial plateau in the region under the meniscus is divergent and suboptimal. So now let's try a higher location spot, maybe up here with the spinal needle. We'll call this number two. So as this one comes in, you can see that it's clearly too high and that the vector form between the spinal needle and the posterior tibial plateau is convergent. And so let's position one last time and try something in between those two. How about right here, we'll call this one number three. And as a reference here are one and two. And you can see that this skin incision spot gives optimal access to the posterior horn of the meniscus and forms a vector between the undersurface of the meniscus and the posterior tibial plateau that is parallel. So this is where I'm going to incise. It doesn't matter if you make your incision vertical or horizontal. And then the trocar is used to confirm that the vector is a straight shot to the space between the meniscus and the tibial plateau posteriorly in the region of tearing, as previously mentioned. So now that we've determined where to incise, the next step is to develop and maintain the portal. Again, the camera is inserted through the antralateral portal, and the tear region within the posterior horn is visualized while the spinal needle and trocar used to establish the portal vector. Then the camera can be rotated 180 degrees to look back at the fat as a radio frequency ablation wand is used to open up the portal just enough so that the same pathway can be reused for all instrument insertions throughout the case. I found the best way to do this is to insert the ablator into the knee and hold the ablation button down as the wand is retracted back to the level just shy of the skin and then to put it back in, rotate it 180 degrees, and then repeat that step on the other side. And then it's important to try to find that portal each time that you insert a device or instrument. And this is easiest to do by gently bouncing at slightly different angles until you fall into the originally created pathway. And this avoids pulveration of the fat pad, which can cause increased postoperative pain. And so here's a quick clinical example using the same device. There's a vertical tear of the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus just central to the popliteal hiatus. And the upper jaw is placed behind the femur before the lower jaw is extended forward underneath the meniscus. Then the sutures pass from bottom to top on both sides of the tear, the lower jaw retracted, and the device removed. 
And here's a slow motion replay of the approach vector. And notice that as the lower jaw is extended under the meniscus, it's optimally parallel to the tibial plateau in the region under the tear. And again, I like the circumferential compression stitch because it allows reduction and compression of the top and bottom of a vertical tear at the same time. And because it doesn't entrap the meniscus to capsule and minimizes neurovascular risk. All right, let's shift to talking about how best to approach different regions of the meniscus. If your working portal is in the same compartment as the tear, in this case medial, you can access and operate on the posterior horn region. But to get to the meniscus body region, you need to switch the camera into the previous working portal within the tear compartment and use a cross compartment portal. To do this, it's easiest to place a switching stick into the working portal along the previously developed pathway under arthroscopic visualization, and then put the camera along this switching stick into the compartment. Also note that the work that we did in establishing a best portal vector in the original working portal continues to reward us, as now the camera is in a perfect vector for ideal visualization of the desired region of the meniscus. To get the access from the cross portal, you usually need to make a new portal higher than the previous lateral camera portal. And this allows you to clear the tibial spine, which is typically in the way. So at the top is a new working portal, below is a previous camera portal. It usually ends up being about a centimeter or so above it. And this lets you clear the tibial spine so that you can sew that entire body region. If you don't create this new higher portal, you'll really struggle to access the tibial side of the body of the medial meniscus. Now, when working on the lateral meniscus, your originally created medial portal is usually high enough to clear the tibial spine and access the body region. And another point, let's say you have a tear at the junction of the posterior horn and body of the lateral meniscus. In order to get a good reduction, you may need to pass each limb of a side-to-side -side stitch from a different portal. In this example, the body region of the lateral meniscus would be sewn from the medial portal and the posterior horn from the original camera portal. An alternate way to do this would be to place a loop stitch through one portal and a standard stitch through another portal, and then use a loop stitch to pull one limb of the standard stitch, leaving a figure of eight stitch. So the posterior horns are typically best approached from same compartment portals, and the meniscus body regions are best approached from opposite compartment portals, and may need to be higher depending on the shape of the tibial spine in any given knee. Finally, the anterior horn can be operated on from either portal. And for a pair, we can either employ outside-in techniques from a same compartment incision, or we can bring in a spectrum-like device from the opposite compartment portal to place circumferential compression stitches around the tear. And so here's a clinical example of a vertical tear of the anterior horn of the meniscus. And this can be cleaned up with a shaver to stimulate healing of the edges. And the idea here is to come in through the opposite portal with the spectrum, looking through the same compartment portal, and then twist this through so that you get a true circumferential compression stitch, which will compress the, the bottom and the top of the tear at the same time. And I like using the spectrum device because you can push in the OPDS suture directly and then you have both limbs to tie. But you can also use a suture lasso or many companies make similar devices. And then this is tied down and cut and I, you can put multiple in. Note that the suture passer comes in through the portal. You have to be able to see the metal of the spectrum come in so that after you pass the stitch around the tear you have two limbs to tie to each other within the joint. This is an all inside technique. When you're doing outside in or inside out, you often won't see uh, anything come into the joint until after it's on the other side of the tear. So here it is putting, putting the last stitch in and tying it down, and this gives you a nice, uh, again, circumferential compression stitch around the tear. Thank you very much for your time and interest. Uh, I've really uh, enjoyed putting this together.